I'm going to start by asking a very strange question. Do fish know that they live in water? I, I don't, I, I can't remember the film that I saw this in because it's been a while now, but I remember seeing a film uh, years ago now where there was the, it was an animated thing and, and these two fish were talking and one of them had found out that they needed water to survive. And he told the other fish and the other fish panics because he doesn't even know what water is. And he's like, I'm going to die if I don't figure out what this water is. And I find some. And so the whole movie revolves around this fish trying to find water. And uh, of course, in the end, realizes that he doesn't, he's, he's always been in water and just didn't realize what water was. They do know when they're out of water. That is very true. Yeah. So I asked that question because when we grow up in a family and it's a certain way, it's very easy to just assume that that's normal. That's what normal family life is like. And because we've never known anything different, we just assume this is the way it's supposed to be. And and that becomes what we're familiar with because it's our family. And sadly, like kids that grow up with an alcoholic parent, for example, they just assume that that's normal. That's the way families are. And they've never experienced anything different, so they just assume that that's the way all families are. Or, and often, um, it's not until we see something different that we begin to realize that maybe there is a different way to live. And maybe our situation isn't totally normal. And that can actually be a very painful discovery. Uh, sometimes when it is obvious, like alcoholics or something like that, it can happen early on in life. But there are times where there's more subtle things that are not healthy that we don't really discover about our own families until way later in life. And it can be very, very upsetting. And <clears throat> a lot of us probably have experiences like this and maybe sometimes don't even realize why we are upset as we're going through life discovering these things. So Jesus, he had some things to say about families. And this morning, we're going to look at a passage that actually is pretty shocking. It's Jesus talking and Jesus says some things that kind of... Well, you might think they are a bit out of character for Jesus, actually, if at first glance, at least. So I'm going to invite you to fasten your seatbelts here and hang on to your hats, because what we're going to read this morning might blow some of your, your ideas about Jesus right out of the water. So I want to go to Matthew. Matthew is the very first book in the New Testament, which is the last one third of the Bible. And Matthew was actually one of Jesus' closest friends. And so he's, he's not just writing down secondhand information. He actually heard Jesus say these words with his own ears. And he's not writing it down like, Years and years and years later, it was actually very soon after Jesus said this that he wrote it down. So we can be pretty sure that what he wrote here is pretty accurate to what Jesus said. So I want to go to chapter 10, starting in verse 34. And there it says, and Jesus is speaking here. 
He says, don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. Jesus, I, what? And then the next verse, he says, I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Your enemies will be in your own household. And then he takes it even a step further and he goes, if you love your father or mother more than you love me, you're not worthy of being mine. And if you love your son or daughter more than me, you're not worthy of being mine. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. And if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. Okay, let's just take a big deep breath here for a minute. What are you talking about, Jesus? This sounds like crazy talk. Like Jesus came to create discord in families. I thought Jesus was here to help us live better family lives, to get along with people, not to create conflict. But this is the thing about the Bible. It is absolutely honest. Jesus never sugarcoats things. He just tells it the way it is. And I love that about the Bible. I love that about Jesus. He's not dancing around issues. He just lays it out there. This is the way it is. So it's, un, it's important whenever you read the Bible to understand the culture of that time. To be able to understand how the people that Jesus was actually talking face to face with at that time understood what he was saying. Because we can't really understand what, how it applies to us until we understand how they would have understood it. So, first of all, we need to understand how the family worked at Jesus <clears throat> during the time that Jesus was here on earth. So, first of all, when two people got engaged, so they decided that they were going to form a new family, the, they would make an arrangement, they would agree that they were going to marry each other. And actually in Jesus day, when you were engaged, you were, you were absolutely committed to each other at the same level as you, as if you were married. So it was basically impossible to break an engagement during that time in that culture. But then when they were engaged, the husband to be, would go home to his parents' house and start building on to his parents' house. And he'd build a room onto his parents' house that was for him and his new bride. And so she would be waiting for him to finish building that place where they were going to live. And then once he was finished, then he would go and get his bride and then they would be married and then they would move into this, this addition to his parents' house. Now, just a sidebar here for those of you that are, you know, reading your Bibles, especially the New Testament on a regular basis, you will see references to this idea coming through in the New Testament on a regular basis with regards to heaven. Jesus talks about how he, he's going to prepare a place for us. And then he will return to come and get us. And that comes from this cultural concept. That he's, it's like Jesus is engaged to the church now. But he's gone back to his father's house. And he's preparing a place for his bride, the church. And when he's finished... He will come and get us and then we'll be together in his father's house forever and ever. 
That's where this imagery comes from, is this the way that families worked in that day. <clears throat> so when you understand that, those references take, take on a whole new meaning. So that's, that's a sidebar, but I just wanted to kind of throw that out there for those of you that are, are studying this kind of thing because it, it makes it come alive in a new way. So back to the culture, can you imagine how close-knit the families would have been when they literally were living in the same house? How many of you ladies would be thrilled to live in the same house as your mother-in-law? I'm not seeing any people, any ladies with their hands up. <laughs> I wonder why not. If you're watching online and you would love to live with your mother-in-law, please let us know. That's how they did it in Jesus' day. The daughter-in-law would move in with the son into the mother-in-law's and father-in-law's house. They had a separate room that the son, the bride, the bridegroom had, had built, but they, I mean, literally would have eaten their meals together. They would have, you know, raised their kids with their in-laws watching them. They would have, you know, they would have basically done everything together. You know, they, <laughs> they would have, um, yeah, I, I mean, they would have worked together probably like Jesus. I mean, he worked with his dad as a carpenter. So many of the sons would take on the trade of their father. In many cases, it was farming. So they would have worked together in the fields and cared for the livestock and so on. They would have worshiped together, gone to church or synagogue together. Um, and basically their lives were completely intertwined with each other. So they had this multi-generational family situation. Now, I just want you to think about this for a minute. Some of you have in-laws that have some pretty strong opinions about certain things. Don't raise your hand. But you know who you are. Can you imagine living with your in-laws strong opinions right on the other side of the wall at the dinner table every single day. Can you imagine? <laughs> Whoa. So this is the background against which Jesus is saying these words that we just read. And really, when you stop and think about it, that makes these words even more shocking because Jesus is speaking into a culture with extremely close knit families and the family unit, the extended family unit was very, very highly valued. They lived for family. Now we think families are important, but we are not even on the same playing field as what the culture Jesus lived in was as far as valuing family. And Jesus comes in there and says, I have come to create enemies in your families. Can you imagine how that would have gone over? <laughs> they would have been like, what are you talking about? Are you, you, you some kind of crazy person? You would think that Jesus would have preferably come to say, I have come to minimize family disunity. I've come to make your families better. I've come to make more harmony in your families. But no, Jesus says, no, I have come to blow your families up. To make them war zones. So why on earth would Jesus say this? Well, Jesus, I believe, was saying this because he came to introduce 
a completely new way of living life. See, what we grow up with, what's familiar to us, feels comfortable, even when it's unhealthy. And the Jews at that time in Jesus' culture had many very unhealthy ways in which they related to each other as families. There was lots of dysfunction going on in their families. And Jesus came in and said, I want to teach you a better way to live. And the problem is, even when you make improvements within a family unit, it causes division. It causes tension. Even when it's a good thing, you would think when one person in the family says, I want to be healthier, that everybody else in the family would go, yay, finally. But that's not the way families work. Not even to this day, not even with all the counseling and all the books and all the stuff we have today that helps us be healthy in the way we relate to each other. Most families are caught caught in this cycle of tension and conflict whenever one person in the family tries to become healthier. And Jesus was just being honest about that here. He's saying, if you follow me, it's going to create conflict in your family because my way is healthier than the way you are used to. And the way you're used to is going to be something that many of the people in your family are going to want to cling to. For those of you that are familiar with AA or Al-Anon, you know that families with addictions are, are dysfunctional systems. And often families can become the worst enemy of getting free from addiction because they try to hold the person in addiction in that family system. And they put pressure on that person as they're trying to break free from their addiction to stay in that mentality or to keep the system going. And it causes tremendous tension. And Jesus is just being honest. He's saying, yeah, that's reality, folks. This is the way it is. So there's lots of lots of different ways in which Fear passes down from generation to generation. And Jesus came to set us free from those patterns of fear. And he's just saying, okay, I'm going to do this for you, but you have to be committed to following me more than preserving the family system of fear. If this is going to work, you have to be more committed to being healthy my way than to being sick your family's way. You have to be more committed to getting healthy than to preserving the peace with the people around you. So here's some common fears that run in families. I'm just going to kind of list them off one by one. So the fear of poverty. Some families, they just are workaholics because they are scared of poverty. Maybe grandma and grandpa or great grandma and grandpa lived in poverty. And there's this profound fear of going back there. And so every generation just drives themselves to make sure we do not end up back there. Then there's... Some families that are on the opposite end of the spectrum, they're scared of money. And they focus on all the evils that money has done to families. And they are determined we are not going to let that happen to our family. Maybe they've seen money destroy families. Inheritances destroy families. And things like that. And so they just make sure we are not going to accumulate too much money. Because it just ruins families. That's not as common in our culture, but there are families like that. There's some families that are scared of education. 
No, no, I've seen how universities can mess up kids. I do not want to risk that. And so we stick with blue collar jobs. That's just who we are. Some families are scared of management. No, 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 I don't want to do any, I don't want to be foreman. I don't want to be, you know, don't ask me to do anything like that. I just come and I do my job and I go home. I don't want any extra responsibility. Some families are scared of men. The women are scared of men. And usually you can tell when that's the case, when the women are by themselves and they start talking about the men in the family. And they start talking about how they're not doing this right and they're not doing that right and this is bad and that's bad. And they despise them and it can lead to them, women trying to control the men in their families can lead to abuse, often emotional abuse of different kinds. Then there's families, and sometimes this is the same family, where the men fear the women. And the men are trying to control the women. And that can lead to abuse, and often that's physical abuse. In certain families, there's a fear of certain politics. How many of you have seen families where they just vote the same way generation after generation and they never think about really what the party stands for? They just, that's just what mom and dad did, so that's why we vote that way. Anybody seen that? Yeah. They're scared of whatever the opposition to that party is, and so they just keep voting that way. And then there's racism. That runs in families sometimes. They're scared of certain races, and so they always just keep those people at bay, and they don't allow that, those people to get too close, and they're just scared. And they keep passing that on to their kids. And sometimes if the kids dare have the audacity to befriend somebody from that race, it just creates all kinds of havoc in the family system. There are certain families that are scared of certain religions. I don't want to have anything to do with those people. Those people are scary. They're bad. And they pass that on to their kids. Something that's becoming even more common in our culture is people who are scared of any form of religion. Oh no, you don't want to get involved with those religious types. They will mess you up. And they pass that on to their kids. There are certain families that are scared of drugs and alcohol for good reason probably, but they end up despising people who are not scared of drugs and alcohol. And then there's, on the other hand, families that are scared of being sober. Oh no, I've seen how miserable those people are. I certainly don't want to be sober. They wouldn't necessarily articulate that, but that's the way they live. Then there's the fear of commitment. This is one of the ones that we kind of joke about a little bit, but it is a very real fear in some families. Very scared of commitment. I heard about a family, uh, the parents had been together for over 30 years, and the dad refused to come to his daughter's wedding because he was so terrified of commitment. The parents had never married, and he was not going to condone his daughter getting married.
Then there's the fear of anyone outside of our family. You've seen that where it's like, oh, no, they're not part of our family. You know, we, we just keep them at arm's length. You know, blood is thicker than water. And then there's a related one, fear of anyone who's not from our town. For all of you that have grown up in small towns, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> I remember one time uh, we stopped, we were going to Edmonton and we stopped to get some food at one of the tiny little towns along the way. I can't even remember which one it was. And we walked into this coffee shop and the moment we walked into the coffee shop, every single person in the coffee shop stopped and turned to look at us because we were not from that town. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> the fear of anybody that's not from our town. So Jesus basically is telling us that he is going to help us if we follow him to break free from those family patterns of fear. To break out of the stuff that we have lived with and feels familiar to us. That is basically our comfort zone. And he is going to help us break free from our family's ways when necessary. Now, let me just say something that's very important here. Jesus is not saying that he is going to make your family your enemy. He is saying that his way may cause them to make you the enemy. Jesus is not setting you against other people. He's setting your way in a, in a different direction than what your family is going, potentially. And that can make them make you the enemy. See, I know lots of people who are trying to break free from their family ways, but they just blame their families for their misfortune. And as long as you make, their, make people the problem, you're missing the whole point. Then you really have not found a better way. You've just found somebody to blame. And that's not helpful. That's not going to get you to freedom. We need to attack the mindset, not the people. And that's what Jesus teaches us to do. He's saying, follow my ways. Follow my way of thinking. Renew your mind. Move in the direction of health. And that, then if that causes other people to reject you, fine. But you're not there to blame them. You're just there to follow in a better direction. Now, the unfortunate reality is families can be very, very cruel when they feel threatened. They can treat their own worse than perfect strangers when they feel like you are upsetting the apple cart in the family system. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I know that some of you have probably experienced that. Where your own family is absolutely brutal. And this is why Jesus invites us into his family. He invites us into a new family that is, when it works the way it's supposed to, much healthier than most Human families. Now sometimes Jesus' family is still full of unhealthy people that do unhealthy things. But when Jesus' family works the way he intended it, it is family. Or it is a beautiful family and a healthy family. And, and really what Jesus says here, and in other places too, is that he wants his family to become our primary family. He wants us to follow him more than we are committed to our human families. Now, I know that's not 
you know, the way we like to think about Jesus or the, like, the way we like to think about our families. But that's the reality. Jesus is actually calling us to put him over and above our spouses, over and above our kids, over and above our parents. All of those things he's calling us to put secondary to, to him. And many of you know of the struggle going on in my family right now. And I can say, honestly, you people have become my family in the last year. You are closer to me than I've ever experienced in my whole life. And I am so profoundly thankful for all of you, for how you've been, been there for me this past year. I feel like for the first time in my life, I'm actually experiencing at a heart level what I think Jesus intended for us to experience, all of us who are part of his family. And I'm so deeply grateful. So from my heart to you, I'm saying thank you this morning. Thank you for being my family. And sometimes we don't even see how unhealthy our human family is until we experience the family of Jesus and the way it's supposed to function. So it's interesting that the Bible teaches both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament that men are to leave their families and cling to their wives. Why does it say that about men and not women? Well, when you understand what I just explained a few minutes ago about the way families work there, it makes total sense. Women, it was assumed they were going to leave their family because they were going to move in with their in-laws. But Jesus is saying, I actually don't condone that system. He's saying, I want men to leave their father and mother as well. And not just physically leave them, Maybe even you don't have to leave physically, but emotionally leave them. To, to find the pathway to a better, healthier way of being family than what your parents had. God actually never intended for families to be more loyal to each other than they are to him. Now, the truth is that most families that fall apart fall apart because of immaturity, selfishness, things like that. And that's not what God is talking about here. It's not what Jesus came to do. He's not here to, you know, blow up families because we just don't get along. Jesus is actually saying, I want you to follow me to healthier ways. And when the whole family commits themselves to follow Jesus' way, it's a beautiful thing. It's absolutely wonderful. But often that doesn't happen all at the same time. Often there's one person in the family that is trying to follow Jesus more fully than the rest. And when that happens it can cause a lot of tension. If you're in a situation where you are pursuing Jesus with all of your ability, and maybe it's causing some tension in your family, I wonder if it would be helpful for you to get more integrated into Jesus' family. And one of the ways you can do that is by joining a small group, for example. That's like a family unit within the family unit of Jesus. And people in your small group then can become like family to to you. And that's exactly what's happened to me this past year. We have a small group that meets at my house every two weeks. And I've said this several times to them that you have become my family. 
It's an amazing thing for me to be able to interact with them like that about what's going on in my heart. And we all can be open with each other in that environment. Now, maybe you're sitting here going, oh, I don't know if I'm ready for that. Fair enough. I don't want to push you into something that you're not ready for. But I mean, a first step in that direction could be just to volunteer at the church. I mean, instead of having face-to-face, you know, interaction, you could have shoulder-to-shoulder interaction. Sometimes that's a little more comfortable and a good place to start. My question for all of us is, are you pursuing Jesus' way of love and freedom even if your family doesn't? I remember when I was a kid, my parents were pastoring and there was a young fellow and his parents were in the church where my dad pastored, but their son, he was 16 at the time, he was not following Jesus at all. And he was really into the party scene and all of that. And his girlfriend broke up with him and he was pretty devastated. And one day he was riding uh, his motorcycle and dad was out walking, uh, walking on the road with one of our animals, I think. And, and, uh, and just out of the blue, he decided to stop on his bike. And he started chatting with dad and Dad invited him over to our house, and so they came over to our, he came over to our house, and before he left, he'd given his heart to Jesus. And when he gave his heart to Jesus, he was all in. He was radical. <laughs> and he used to come to our house every night after work, and he, would just, he was just like a sponge. He just was soaking in everything about Jesus he could get his hands on. And... I didn't know about this at the time, but later dad told me one day he got a call from this fellow's mom who was in their church and, and uh, she was mad. She said to dad, what are you doing to our son? Like he's just gone crazy about Jesus and it's just so disturbing. And, and dad said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, he's, he can't talk about anything but Jesus. And he's like, well, is that a bad thing? Well, he doesn't have to be that radical about it. Like, and dad says, well, did did you like it better before when he was partying and, you know, all of that? Well, no, but I mean, can't you have a happy medium somewhere? But he was experiencing this, this thing that he was pursuing Jesus with all his heart, but the rest of his family were not quite there. And it was creating tension. And as far as I know, it, what, that tension lasted for years, actually, because he was just so focused on going all out for Jesus. So my question for all of us today is, how are you becoming more like Jesus in the way you relate to your family? Is your passion for Jesus creating tension? Something to think about. Now, maybe you're sitting here today or watching online and you say, well, I I don't know about Jesus. I'm not really following him at all. But maybe you're kind of fascinated by that and you would like to learn more about that. And if you are, I'm going to pray in a minute here and I'd welcome you to pray with me and invite Jesus to to start leading you. To take, take a place of leadership in your life. But for all of us, I would encourage us to ask the question every morning when you are in your prayer time with Jesus for Jesus to give you clarity 
about how to become healthier, how to pursue his way and move out of the unhealthy ways that your family has, has had. I heard somebody say one time that you need to pay attention to the tension. If there's tension in your family, maybe you need to be praying and asking God, is this tension because I'm pursuing Jesus or is it because I'm being selfish? Hopefully it's the first one. And if so, you need to just keep doing that. But if the tension is because you're selfish, then then you need to change and pursue Jesus instead. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that you are so honest with us. That you didn't beat around the bush, try to pretend that everything was going to be wonderful and happy and just one sweet and loving and everybody was going to love us and be kind to us when we followed you. You were honest about the fact that this can cause tension and problems. But Jesus, I want to pursue you even when it's hard. So help me to understand when there's tension, if that's because of my selfishness or if it's because I'm pursuing you. Help me, Jesus, to see clearly why this is happening. And Jesus, for all those that aren't following you yet, but are very curious or all even at the point where they're ready to say, yes, Jesus, I'm, I'm wanting to follow you. I pray that you would come into their hearts right now, that you would fill them with your love, your grace and your wisdom, and that you would begin to, to change the way they think to align with your way of thinking. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.